wireless media examples, wireless transmission media. First one, terrestrial microwave. So here's an example. Uh, terrestrial means on the ground. Here we, our transmitter and receiver on the ground. The next example is satellite microwave, where one of the devices is a satellite up in space. So on the ground. Microwave refers to a range of frequencies. Do not confuse it, and I have in the past of being a wavelength with micrometers, if not that. It just refers to a range of frequencies, typically in the order of gigahertz, several gigahertz up to tens of gigahertz. Microwave. Similar, when we talk about infrared, it refers to a range of frequencies. X-ray refers to a range of frequencies in a spectrum, visible light, and so on. So a terrestrial microwave transmitting from stations on the ground as opposed to a satellite. And a typical example is on the top of this building we have an antenna, one of those dish antennas. It's actually, I, I can't remember, I think it's about, it's about a one meter diameter dish antenna on top of this building, maybe smaller. And it's pointed at an antenna on the top of a building at Rungsit campus, at SIT. And that's a terrestrial microwave link between the two campuses. So there's a wireless link between the two campuses. So we have these parabolic dish antennas configured to transmit in a point-to-point -point configuration. That is, the antennas are highly directional. When they concentrate all the energy in one direction. They do not transmit in very high energy in other directions. Therefore, to connect them together, you need to orient, you need to rotate the antenna so it's pointing directly at the receiver. If you misalign the antenna, they will not be able to communicate. So that's common with point-to-point -point wireless links. You need to point your antenna at the receiver. Do I need to do that with my laptop? I have an antenna in the back of the screen. If I want to communicate with that access point, I don't need to point the antenna at the access point. It's an antenna which is usually an omnidirectional antenna. It's not highly directional. That My antenna transmits in all directions, usually on one plane. It's close to an isotropic antenna. A highly directional antenna would be you need to point the antennas at the that transmit and receive at each other, which is, makes life more difficult, but we can get much more concentration of power with directional antennas, much stronger, uh, much higher gains. Normally we need line of sight communications, meaning between the transmitter and receiver, they need to be able to see each other, no obstructions or no large obstructions between them. For example, if someone, where are we? that direction. If someone come and built a building next to SIT which was 10 stories, 10 floors high, then maybe our wireless link to the other campus would not work because it would not pass through the building. So having wireless links and point-to-point -point links especially is a problem because you need to avoid obstructions. That's why the antennas are normally placed high on antenna towers or on buildings. So they don't have to pass through smaller buildings, through people, through trees, and so on. Used commonly for long distance c communications uh, and for connecting between buildings. So our link between campuses is a single wireless link, which is about, I don't know, 12 to 15 kilometers with that single wireless link. Using large enough antennas, even though there's some path loss across that distance, with large enough antennas and a large enough transmit power, we can receive the signal at the Rungsit campus. Another example, some, uh, well, what's the alternative for SIT? For, if we want to connect to the Rungsit campus, we can pay for a wired link. We, we would not pay and build our own wired link between the two campuses. If we wanted to do that, that is lay some cables between the two campuses, we would need to get permissions from all the landowners between the two campuses because we'd need to dig a hole under their land. And that's quite 
uh, a difficult task and expensive task. To build your own wired network can be expensive because you need to dig the holes under roads, under buildings and so on to lay the cables. So normally you rent or lease access to other people's cables. That is, we pay a telecom company like uh, TOT, we pay them or an internet service provider to use their wired network and transmit our data across their cables from one campus to another. In fact, we do that. We have both a wireless link and a wired link to the other campus, really as to provide some extra bandwidth or extra data rate and as a backup. The problem of using the wired link is we need to pay someone. With our wireless link between the two campuses, we buy an antenna and the transmitter, and same at the other campus, we do not need to pay anyone now we use that. So that's the advantage of using a wireless link in that case. It's easier to set up and lower cost in some cases. Unless you need a license to use the frequency. For example, with mobile phone systems, you can set up the, the base stations, the transmitters and so on, but you need a license to use that frequency and that's expensive. Typically using bands, uh, frequencies in the range of 2 gigahertz up to 18 gigahertz, so there are different technologies using these frequencies in terrestrial microwave for things like TV transmission, uh, TV distribution across a large area, um, connecting uh, across a, a large area instead of using cables like between our two campuses. Use point-to-point -point wireless links. Some cases use point-to-multipoint. So mobile telephone systems fall within this category that, where it's point-to-multipoint. Mobile phone tower to multiple mobile phones. Talking about data rates of tens of megabits per second newer systems, maybe hundreds of megabits per second. That's one example of where wireless is used. Mobile phones, point-to-point -point wireless links. Another example, so that's on the ground where the transmitter and receiver on the ground. Another is when the trans transceiver is up in space or is a satellite. So some communication satellite acts as a relay node. So we have two points on the ground that want to communicate that are a long way away from each other. One option, get wires to connect them. Another option, to use terrestrial microwave and have maybe repeaters or amplifiers to transmit across multiple wireless links. The third option, use a satellite. Transmit from one ground station up to the satellite. The satellite relays what you send and sends it down to another ground station. Good for connecting across a large area. as shown here. The, of course we have stations on the ground called earth or ground stations. It may be a, a dedicated device or it may be a small terminal that you can have at home. And we talk about an uplink and a downlink. We send up to the satellite, the satellite takes what you send up and simply repeats w what you send up and sends it down to some destination. Depending upon the positioning of the satellite, we can cover cover quite a large area, like almost one third of the Earth can be covered with a single satellite. Another configuration is, um, so this is a point to point link. We have one point on the Earth via the satellite to another point. Another configuration is a point to multipoint use of satellites, sometimes called broadcast. Broadcast means sending to many or to all in some network. For example, your satellite TV. The TV station sends the TV content to some ground station, the transmitter, sends it up to the satellite, the satellite transmits, and everyone within the coverage area of that satellite who has a receiver can receive the same transmission. So this is point to multipoint transmission. And for example, True Vision's TV you have the dish at home, the satellite company transmits the TV content up to the satellite which then comes down to everyone who has the dish who's within the coverage area of the satellite. 
the coverage area of the satellite depends upon the location of the satellite, how far up in space it is, how high it is, going back. So there are different orbits that satellites can be in. There's the different positions above the Earth. A common orbit is called a geostationary orbit, or a geosatellite, where the satellite is at a position such that because the Earth rotates, and the sat satellite's in an orbit that's also rotating, with a geostationary or orbit, as the Earth rotates, the satellite rotates at a speed such that it always appears above the same spot on Earth. So the Earth is rotating here, the satellite rotating up here. As they rotate, if you look up from the Earth, you'll see that same satellite all the time. It's as if the satellite is fixed from a particular p position on the Earth. If this is us on the ground with a geostationary satellite, it's at a position or at an orbit such that it, if it transmits its signal down, it can cover a large portion of the Earth, maybe about one third of the Earth. And as the Earth rotates, so does the satellite in its orbit, such that if we have our transmitter on the ground here, from the perspective of that transmitter, the satellite will always be above it, even as the Earth rotates. It will not be moving. So for 24 hours a day, it can receive from that satellite, that geostationary satellite. To be in such an orbit, you need the satellite to be about 36,000 kilometers above the Earth. And when it's there, and it stays in that orbit, then it can provide coverage of about a third of the Earth. So if you want to have global coverage, you need three satellites around the Earth. So for coverage for everyone in the, in the world, you need multiple satellites there. As a so if we have a ground station here, and another ground station here, let's say this is in Thailand and this is uh, in Japan, then instead of connecting via the wired network, then we can simply trans up, transmit up to the satellite and because they're both within coverage of that same satellite, the satellite transmits down and re is received in the ground station at Japan. So we can cover a large area for our transmission. There are other orbits. You don't have to have a satellite at this orbit. Usually there are lower orbits. One of them called the low Earth orbit, LEO satellites, where they are much closer. Uh, here's a, a satellite in a LEO orbit, so hundreds of kilometers above the Earth. What that means, they're in an orbit that from the perspective of the ground station, the satellite is moving. The Earth is rotating, but the satellite is also rotating, and they're at different angular velocities, so that from the, this ground station, if you look up, you'll see the satellite moving above you. And as a result, the coverage of that satellite is smaller, because it's closer to the Earth. If it looks down, it can only cover some part of the Earth maybe thousands of kilometer radius footprint. This is the footprint. And we do not all, always cover that same location with that satellite. So maybe for a period of 10 minutes or one hour, I'm within coverage of the satellite. But two hours later, the satellite is around here and I'm here. So I'm no longer in coverage of that satellite. That's the problem with the lower orbits. If I want to have continuous coverage, so I can always communicate, we would need multiple satellites. Another one here, which has some coverage, and another one here. So that you can think these are moving. From my perspective, first I communicate via this satellite, 
And as that one goes out of range, the next one comes along and provides me coverage and so on. And we have multiple satellites around the, around the globe to provide continuous coverage. Many of the systems, satellite systems we use today use geostationary orbits, TV distribution, for example, uh, even some internet satellite services. The g low Earth orbits are uh, not as common because you need many satellites. It's much more complex to, to manage such a network. Iridium is one system that uses low Earth orbits or close to, has about, I think, 60, 60 plus satellites currently orbiting the Earth to provide coverage for people who have telephone access via a satellite phone, say, in Antarctica and in, in remote locations. So there are different orbits which provide different levels of coverage. The problem with the geostationary orbit, the good thing is it provides a wide coverage and a fixed coverage. The problem is the propagation delay. Propagation delay is distance divided by speed. Distance from here to the satellite is about 36,000 kilometers, 36 million meters. That's the height of the satellite. So when I transmit to the satellite, I need to transmit a signal that goes for 36 million meters and the speed, the speed of light, sorry, 300 million meters per second gives us a propagation delay of 120 milliseconds. What that means is when I transmit via a geo satellite, I send up and then the satellite sends down. Going via that satellite adds a delay, a, prop a propagation delay of 240 milliseconds. 120 up, 120 down. We cannot avoid that. There's no way to avoid that. We cannot change the propagation delay. When you're browsing websites, if you're using satellite internet, this extra 120 up, 120 down milliseconds can start to be noticeable by users because there's also a delay inside the wired network, other delays, plus the 240 milliseconds. So it adds a quarter of a second to everything that you do when you access the network via geo satellite. When you're talking on a voice, using voice communications via a phone, a delay of 240 milliseconds can be quite noticeable when you talk to someone, plus other delays. So the problem with a geostationary satellite, it's so far away and it in incurs a large propagation delay. LEOs are closer, smaller delays, but more complex to provide coverage across a, a large area. TV, that's the point to multipoint configuration of satellites. Used for TV distribution, long distance telephone communications. Some companies may have some small terminals on them so that they can communicate via remote offices together via a satellite. GPS, internet in remote locations uh, where there's no wired internet access then sometimes satellite internet is the only reasonable option. We don't have time, or we will not go through it right now, I think we don't have time, but this is just another example online on the website that you can find some slides. In Thailand has TICOM4, which is geostationary satellite, it provides the IP star service and it's a geo satellite you can have a look it provides coverage of most of Asia or Southeast Asia so it actually has multiple antennas that transmit down they provide or multiple different beams for example it has a beam covering all of Australia and then these smaller these blue places are called spot beams which has small beams directed to particular locations like into Bangkok, to Malaysia, Indonesia, New Zealand, 
and Japan and so on. And IP Star is a satellite internet service. That is, you have a dish at home and a modem at home, and you can transmit up and receive from the satellite and access the internet via some ground station. You can look at the details via the IP Star website. That's where these pictures come from. So just an example of uh, a satellite system, ipstar.com. Terrestrial microwave, satellite microwave. Another example that you see or you use on a regular basis, generally called broadcast radio. Things like FM radio, UHF, VHF, TV in some countries. Access points, laptops, Wi-Fi falls into this category where we transmit in frequencies ranging from 30 megahertz up to several gigahertz is generally classified as broadcast radio. M many times not using directional antennas but using omnidirectional antennas where we try to transmit in all directions. As my laptop does, it transmits in all directions around it, basically, the antenna. And, of course, as long as the access point's in range, as has is close enough due to the path loss, it will receive it. If I had a directional antenna on here, I would need to face it towards the access point, which is inconvenient. So another example of where wireless media are used. We will not go through the examples in any more detail. Some of you will take ITS 413 next semester with me, if you take the ICT track, and we will look at Wi-Fi and wireless LANs uh, in some more detail then. So just three quick examples of different wireless media, which finishes, finishes that topic and leaves us the last one hour or less than one hour to cover the last topic. In fact, to cover just one quarter of this last topic because you need that one quarter for the exam. So, last topic, transmission media, is about the, th the parts between the transmitter and receiver which we send our signals via. The topic before that, remember we looked at the structure of signals, sine waves, how do we have equations to represent signals and so on. Yep. The topic, what we're going to talk about today is in the exam. That's why I want to cover it today. Otherwise, you will not be able to answer the exam question. Okay? So, yes, in the exam. But I'll tell you exactly what parts. So, we'll not cover all of this today. Remember, with signals, we, we worked out the relationship or some relationships between frequency, bandwidth, and data rate. And one of the schemes that we used in our example, we said when we had and we, we had a sine wave, but we had something like this, and our what we were saying was when the signal is high, that represents one bit. It's a signal high represents bit zero, and when the signal is low, if this is zero volts and maybe this is plus one volt, minus one volt, volt, not a watt. When the signal's at one level, it represents a bit. When it's at a different level, it represents another bit. This is a signal encoding scheme. We encode our data as a signal. This is the simplest scheme that we looked at. Remember also we had a case where we tried, what if we have four levels? One like this, 
we might have drawn it like that, but we had four different levels for our signal. How many bits per level? We could encode two bits in each level. So that's a different signal encoding scheme. That's what this topic is about, is about how do we encode our data as signals, whether it's digital data as an analog signal, as a digital signal, or analog data. Today, we're only going to cover how do we encode digital data bits as digital signals, some pulse, some positive voltage or some negative voltage, and the schemes that are available. We see there are four combinations because we have either analog or digital data and analog and digital signals, so we have four combinations in that case. We will cover just the first one because there's a question in the midterm exam about the first one. Digital signaling is when we send digital signals. It can the digital signals can carry either digital or analog data. We want to choose a scheme to encode our data such that we conserve bandwidth, we use as little bandwidth as possible, and we minimize errors. That is, when we transmit our signal at the receiver, when it decodes, we should have as few errors as possible. Well, that's some of our aims. Analog signaling is when we send an analog signal. Let's not cover that today. We'll, we'll return to that next week. We'll just focus on digital signaling, just so we can spend some more time on that. When we want to send digital data as a digital signal. We'll come back to analog signaling after the midterm. The first diagram here shows, just to introduce some terminology before we look at the specifics, if we're sending a digital signal from the source to transmitter, so in this case, here's the signal, here's an example of that signal, then we have as an input data, it's either digital or analog data, it's either zeros and ones, or maybe it's audio or video, some analog data, some voice. To convert it to a digital signal, we perform encoding. We encode the data as a digital signal. We send the signal to the receiver. The receiver converts that digital signal back to the original data, which is the process of decoding. Together, this coder and decoder together is called a codec. So the codec, a codec is the process of uh, treating digital signals. If we're using analog signals, which we're going to look at after the midterm, but if we're looking, using analog signals, whether it's analog or digital data, we perform a process of modulation. We modulate the data onto an analog signal and demodulate at the other endpoint, and we get a modem when we combine them. We'll cover them later. There are some advantages and disadvantages of each of the four combinations. Again, with limited time, we're going to come back to that after the midterm and just focus on the first one, digital data, digital signals. we give you time to understand that. So the problem here is that I have bits, zeros and ones, and I want to transmit pulses of voltage, some high voltage and some low voltage. The exact value we don't care about, we talk about different levels of the voltage. And we hold that pulse for a particular period of time to represent some data. How do we encode those bits as digital signals? Well, this is one approach. Quite simple. Bit zero, encoder as a positive voltage. Bit one as a negative voltage. Any sequence of zeros and ones, we just change the voltage for a, that pulse duration. We'll see there are more complex schemes. So a digital signal is a sequence of voltage pulses. We can refer to a pulse as a signal element. And we've mentioned this before, a signal element. 
and we encode our data, our data element, into signal elements. We map the digital data into some signal element. The way that we perform that mapping is called a signal encoding technique. We also know this from our previous examples we saw that okay we have some data rate the, how fast we send our bits we also have a signal rate how fast we send our signal elements they are not the same in this encoding scheme they would be the same if our signal the rate at which we see, send signal elements here's one signal element here's another and another if the rate was 1000 signal elements per second then the data rate would be 1,000 bits per second because we have one bit per signal element. But if we encode two bits per signal element and send 1,000 signal elements per second, then we can send 2,000 bits per second. So the encoding scheme, given a signaling rate, sometimes called a modulation rate, determines the data rate how fast we send our bits. We've seen this diagram before. It's the impact of noise on an example signal where we get bit errors. Remember, we had some digital data. We converted to a digital sig signal using the same scheme as here. Bit 0 is high, bit 1 is low and we have some noise in the system. The receiver receives the signal plus the noise. And we went through the case where we, the receiver maps the receive signal back to bits. Because of this large amount of noise here, we got a bit error here. Transmitted was bit one, received from the receiver's perspective was bit zero. And because of this a large amount of noise here, we got another bit error. The more noise, the more bit errors in general. And that's what this point covers. We can talk about the rate of errors, the rate of bit errors, the bit error rate, the BER. If we increase noise, the error rate goes up. If we reduce the noise, it goes down. We talk about the noise relative to the signal, and we talk about the signal to noise ratio, SNR, where that is simply the signal power divided by the noise power. So increasing the noise makes the signal to noise ratio go down and makes the bit error rate go up. Increasing the signal to noise ratio, making the signal much stronger than the noise, reduces our errors. We know that generally increasing the bandwidth increases the data, data rate. Also, and you may see it from this diagram, if you increase your data rate, you increase the chance of bit errors, the bit error rate. In this example, note this peak of noise here. That impacted upon one bit. It caused one bit error here. Why? Because this peak of noise lasts for about the duration of one pulse or one signal element. It's about the duration of one bit. If the noise was longer, it could cause, cause errors on more bits. Or the other way, if we had the same noise and the signal elements were shorter, it would cause more errors. That is, given this data rate, if we double the data rate, it means we halve the signal element duration. We halve the duration of the pulse. And the same amount of noise could, could affect two bits in that case. Increasing the data rate can cause more bit errors. So we have a number of trade-offs to deal with. What, what else impacts upon successful reception of our data? The signal encoding scheme. Whether we use this scheme that we've gone through or other schemes. So let's spend the last 30 minutes going through some example signal encoding schemes. You read through them. I'm, I'm going to 
First, what we're going to do is go through and explain through some examples how the encoding schemes work. Then after that, we'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages. I'm going to go through examples on the board. You don't have to copy them because it's these examples that I'm going to draw. So let me make some space. We have some digital data to send. It's up the top here. And I'm going to draw how many bits? 11 bits. Again, you don't have to draw this because it's already on the next slide. Oh, on this side. The bits that we want to send for this example, 0, 1, 0, 0, This will make sense in a moment. This is the description of several common signal encoding schemes for digital data as digital signals. There are others. You don't need to remember all of them. We'll go through some of them with some examples. The re all of them are shown in the examples here. You will need to remember the first two. In fact, they're very simple. In the exam, for example, for the remaining, you do not need to remember them because usually I would give a description. I would give you this information. But let's go through them first. They describe the mapping of the bits, 0 and 1, to the signal level, high or low. The first one is called non-return to 0 level. It is this one. Quite simply, if you have a bit 0, you transmit a digital signal at a high level and if you have a bit 1 you transmit your digital signal at a low level. That's the scheme. Both the transmitter and receiver must know the scheme. They must know the duration of the pulse as well. They must know how long this pulse is here. Let's say one millisecond. So what happens is the transmitter transmits a signal for one millisecond at high level. If it wants to transmit a bit zero, if it wants to transmit a bit one, it will send at a low level, a low voltage, for example, for that same duration. I will not draw the example. I'm sure you can do it where you'd get, for this sequence of data, high, low, high, high, low, low, high, 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 low, low. Okay? That's the the most basic scheme. It's called non-return to zero because you alternate between a positive voltage and a negative voltage. If this dashed line here is zero volts, you do not transmit at zero volts. You do not return to zero. You're only sending at a positive or a negative voltage. So non-return to zero. A slight variation of that is the next one called non-return to zero. Again, we do not transmit at zero volts inverted. We invert the level when we transmit a bit one. When we have a bit zero to send, we maintain the same level as before. We do not have a transition from one level to another. A transition in this terminology is if we're at high level and we move to low level, that's a transition, that's a change. It's an inversion of the levels. We invert the levels. With non-return to zero inverted, or invert on ones, we keep 
we do not have a transition when we transmit a bit zero. When we transmit a bit one, we change the level, we invert at the beginning of the level. Just to remind me, where do we start? So let's try that with our data. Assuming we start at a low level, this assumption would either be told to you or you make the assumption yourself. We'll see the difference when we see some of the others. Let's assume that our signal in the past was low. Then we want to transmit a bit zero. So for the duration of a pulse, we maintain a level the same as before. With bit zero, there's no transition. So we use the same level as before, which is also low. We transmit at a low level. I'll just move it up to give space for the next one. Transmit at a low level with a bit zero. Now I want to transmit a bit one. The scheme says we, with a bit one we have a transition. That is, we invert the level. We move up to a high level, a positive voltage, and transmit. The next bit to transmit is zero. So with zero, we do not change the level. We keep transmitting at the positive voltage. The next bit, zero, do not change the level, no transition. Bit one is, needs to be transmitted, so we invert. We go back to a negative voltage and transmit. Bit one is to be transmitted, invert, or we'll have a transition. Bit zero, maintain the level, maintain the level, maintain the level. Bit one, invert again. And the last bit one, invert. There's our digital signal for the data if we use non-return to zero inverted or non-return to zero invert on ones. Just a different encoding scheme. After we go through the examples, we'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages of some of the different schemes. You should be able to, given some data, draw this signal. Or, given this signal, you should be able to work out what the digital data is. You would see, you'd need to make some assumption in this case what the previous bit was. Let's try another one. Yeah. This is the second one. Correct? Is it the same? Yes. The first one is the very basic where you just go high for bit zero, low for bit one. I didn't draw that. You've got it on the slides. I've just drawn the second scheme here. Non-return to zero, I, meaning invert on the ones. There are other schemes. We'll see one of the problems, well, no, we'll discuss later the problems with the first two. Another scheme is called bipolar AMI, where AMI means alternate mark inversion. Again, we're going to invert our levels, <coughs> transition between levels, when we have alternate ones. When we have a bit zero, we're going to transmit at zero voltage. Bit zero, zero voltage. When we have a bit one, either a positive or negative voltage. But we're going to change for successive ones. So the first one we send may be a negative voltage. The next time we send a bit one, we'll send a positive voltage. Then negative, positive, negative, and so on. Zero, always send, it says here, no line signal, that is zero volts. Let's try. Bit zero, here's zero volts, the dashed line. Bit zero needs to be transmitted. Transmit at zero volts, that is, there's no line signal there. Now, a bit one needs to be transmitted. We transmit it at a, either a positive or a negative voltage, depending upon the previous bit one. In this example, we don't have a previous bit one. 
So I'll make an assumption that the previous one was, let's say, negative. In the exam, either I would tell you make that assumption or you would choose either negative or positive. If the previous was negative, then this bit one needs to be positive. We'll see how that works with the other bit ones. Bit zero to be transmitted? Zero volts. Bit zero to be transmitted? Zero volts. Bit one to be transmitted? Down. We transmit at a non-zero value the opposite to the previous bit one. The previous bit one was positive, so this bit one will be negative. The next bit one, we invert, we go up to positive. Bit zero, 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 bit one. The previous bit one was positive, this one is negative. And the last one will be positive. Bit zeros, zero volts. Bit ones alternate between positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, and so on. Okay? So we alternate for successive ones, we alternate the level for, between positive and negative, or invert the level. That's bipolar AMI, another encoding scheme. Pseudo ternary is the opposite. We, instead of on bit ones inverting a level, on bit zero we invert the level. For each zero we invert. We will not draw, draw that. Let's give just an example for bipolar AMI. Here's a received signal. What's the data? Bipolar AMI, what's the data? where this is zero volts here. Zero, zero, one. zero. slower. Zero. One. This is non-zero, so it must be one. one. Zero. One. There's two here. Zero. Easy, okay? If you get an exam question like that, simple. What about this bipolar AMI? Quick. First one. What's this? This is an error because we need to alternate between the successive ones. High, low, should be high. If we receive this, the receiver has detected an error. So this is an advantage, an advantage of some encoding schemes. With the encoding scheme, there are some disallowed sequences. In this case, you're not allowed to have two low levels one after the other. If, it, if this happens, the receiver knows something has gone wrong because the transmitter would never transmit this. Maybe there was a bit error. Something went wrong here. 
in, in one of these parts. Or maybe this was supposed to be zero. So at least the receiver knows there's an error here. That is, this encoding scheme has inbuilt error detection. If you can detect errors, that's useful because later you can fix them. You'll see that if you check the previous two, the non-return to zero, would not be able to detect an error. We would not know that there's an error in that case. But with bipolar AMI and other schemes, we can detect errors in some cases. So that's an advantage of some schemes. You can try pseudo ternary. The last two, Manchester and differential Manchester. In these two cases, we transition in the middle of an interval. So here's a, our pulse, or our interval. We're normally transitioning between the intervals. But with Manchester, we have a transition in the middle of the interval as well. With normal Manchester encoding, if we want to transmit a bit zero, in the middle of the interval, we have a transition from high to low, from high down to low. And the opposite for bit one, from low up to high. You can try that. You'll see the example. Let's go through an example with differential Manchester. With differential Manchester, in the middle of the interval, we always change levels from high to low or low to high. In addition, if we're transmitting a bit zero, we will change the level at the start of the interval, but not with bit one. Let's try it. So this was non-return to zero invert on ones. This was bipolar AMI. Now we're doing differential Manchester, the last one. Always invert in the middle of the interval. Also invert if we have a bit zero at the start of the interval. What do we start with? We start with a high. I have a bit zero to send. Assuming previously we were high, with a bit zero, the rule is at the start of the interval, change the level. Go down to low. Then in the middle of the interval, change the level again. So we're always going to change the level in the middle of the interval here. If we have a bit zero, we'll also change at the start. With a bit one, we'll not change at the start. We'll maintain the level. So we now we have a bit one to send. Previous level was high. Maintain that level. Change in the middle. Now we have a bit zero to send. With a bit zero, we change at the start of the interval. So we were low, take it up to high, and then in the middle, change. Bit zero again, change at the start of the interval, go up to high, and then in the middle. Bit one, do not change at the start. Maintain the level, change just in the middle. Bit one, do not change at the start, just in the middle. Bit zero, change at the start and in the middle. Change at the start in the middle for the next bit zero and the third bit zero. Bit one, do not change at the start of the interval. Maintain the level, change in the middle. And the same with the final bit one. Differential Manchester encoding of our data. You can check Manchester as well. You'll see you have it on the next slide. We'll see shortly some of the differences between these. Good question. How did I know where to start? Again, I made an assumption. In this case, because it depends upon the previous level, same with bipolar AMI. We needed to change the, set the level for the bit one depending upon the previous one. If we don't have a previous one, we make an assumption. Here I assumed with bipolar AMI the previous one was negative. In this case, I assumed that the previous level was positive. In an exam, you can make, you can assume either. 
positive or negative. You'll get a different shape, but I would mark both of them correct. If you started as negative, then we'd go up high, across and down. We'd get the opposite shape. So you can assume either, unless I tell you okay, in an exam. In, in practice, what, what to start with will be defined for the particular devices. They would know, start always with positive, for example. They would define that. There are some others. We'll come back to them in, in a moment. Or there are more than just shown here, but some two other popular ones, which are described later in some more detail. Let's look at the differences or some trade-offs between the different signal encoding schemes. Which ones are better? Why, why do we need all these complex ones when we've got our very simple non-return to zero? High, low, high, low. We'll just mention the, the main trade-offs between them when we compare different encoding schemes. The different encoding schemes produce signals with different bandwidths. And we want a signal with a small bandwidth as possible. Without calculating what the bandwidths are and how they come up, this slide summarizes the bandwidths for those different encoding scenes we've gone through. The way to read this, this plot is, OK, here's, for example, Manchester and differential Manchester. The energy. The power is highest here. This is the peak energy. And this is, think of this as the, the frequency range. So the wider it is, the more bandwidth it occupies. It's all normalized, so it doesn't have specific values. But we see that with Manchester, the power, the high power, is spread out across this area. Okay? Whereas with AMI, which is this dash one, the power is concentrated into this smaller bandwidth area. You can think of the most of the power is concentrated in here, whereas with Manchester it's concentrated, it's wider, uh, spread across a wider area. Generally with Manchester encoding we use more bandwidth to transmit the signal, which is a negative. With AMI and pseudo ternary we consume less bandwidth. With non-return to zero, in fact we use, still use a large bandwidth to transmit the signal. So there's trade-offs in terms of the bandwidth of the signals which are generated. Some in the set that we considered, the two that we didn't mention but were listed, B8ZS and HDB3, really the modifications of bipolar AMI, they are the optimal in this case in that they use less bandwidth, they concentrate the power around a particular frequency. The more spread out, the worse in this diagram. So that's one thing that uh, makes a difference between the different encoding schemes. Another thing, error detection. We saw with bipolar AMI, the scheme has inbuilt error detection. That's a good thing. It's a way for the receiver to detect if something has gone wrong due to noise. Why would it happen like this? Maybe the noise reduce the signal down to a negative instead of a zero value. So some schemes have better ability to detect errors. Some don't have any ability to detect errors. Some are more complex to implement at the transmitter and receiver. Note that the Manchester scheme, there are many transitions. We need to change the level more frequently than the others. You see here. That generally leads to a higher cost in the, in the, or a higher complexity and therefore cost in the implementation. Your digital uh, electronics need to change the level much faster than in this case. It only needs to change every, every interval here, here every half of an in interval. So more complex and more costly to implement some schemes. Some work better in the presence of noise. I don't have an example of that. Uh, some schemes provide inbuilt synchronization of clocks. That's a hard one to explain. Let's try and illustrate that. 
So some schemes occupy more bandwidth, that's a negative. Some schemes provide error detection, that's good. Some schemes are more complex, more costly, that's bad. Some schemes allow us to synchronize our clocks. What does that mean? This is our transmitted signal. Uh, and we're transmitting some signal, let's say it's uh, maybe it was bipolar AMI. This is zero volts and this is a positive, meaning a one. So zero, 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 one, if we use bipolar AMI as an example signal that is transmitted. And the duration of each pulse, let's say, is one millisecond. So what happens, the transmitter for one millisecond holds the level here and for the next one millisecond holds the level and so on and here changes the level for one millisecond. Let's assume the clock of the transmitter is perfect. What that means is if we measure real time and the, the electronics in there, the clock perfectly matches real time. That is, the, the devices measure of one millisecond is a true one millisecond. Of, cl of course in devices the clocks may not be perfect. That is, when the device thinks it's one millisecond, it ticks over for one millisecond, it may have been slightly longer or less in real time. So the, for example your computer's clock when it ticks one millisecond, in fact it may have been 0 0.9 milliseconds in real time. That's when we have imperfect clocks in devices. That can cause problems. Why? Let's say our receiver has an imperfect clock. What it thinks as one millisecond in real time is only 0 0.8 milliseconds. So if the receiver receives some signal, then it thinks, so it measures in real, this is the real time, 0 through to 7. At time zero, it receives a signal, and then at time 0 0.8, it thinks that's the end of the first bit, the first pulse, because its clock's, clock is wrong. So it thinks that's the first pulse, and then at time 1.6, which is about here, it thinks that's the end of the second pulse and at 2.4, the third, 3.2, 4, so I'm just incrementing by 0 0.8 because assuming the receiver has a clock that's incorrect. In real time, this is one millisecond, but the receiver thinks it's one millisecond, but in real time it's only 0 0.8 millisecond. 4.8, let's see what we get to, 5.6, 6.4. So the receiver thinks the signal in this 0.8 milliseconds is the first bit. Let's say it measures, measures the signal halfway through and measures this signal at 0 0.4, that's halfway through 0 and 0 0.8 and at 0 0.4 the level is here 0, 0 volts. So it measures at 0 volts. In our case 0 volts corresponds to bit 0. 0 volts corresponds to bit 0. So the receiver has received bit 0. Now, in the next interval, 
let's say it measures in the middle, which is at time 1.2. At time 1.2, the level is still zero. Everything's still zero. Next bit, at time two, the receive signal is zero volts. Still bit zero. At 2.8, the receive signal is bit zero. In the middle between 3.2 and 4, the received it measures is bit zero because the signal level is zero, which corresponds to a bit zero. Next one, also zero. Next one, zero. What about the next one? In the middle of here, what's the signal level? Well, let's say, and to keep my example uh, to work well, it measures at this point of time. It's zero. That is the sum signal level is zero. That corresponds to a bit zero. Zero, zero. Let's see. This is the received data. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight zeros transmitted. One, two, three, four, five, six. Have I got too many? And one bit one. We've got a bit error here. So if the clock is not synchronized, that is, the clocks at the transmitter and receiver are not the same, we get a chance of bit errors. That's a problem. What caused this unsynchronization? Well, one reason when we have this long sequence of zeros, the signal all at the same level. Some of the encoding schemes, especially the Manchester schemes, even if we have a long sequence of zeros, we'll still get a transition. If we have a transition, we can synchronize the clock because we know that indicates the start of the next bit. So with some, some schemes, even if our clock is wrong, the receiver can resynchronize back to the transmitter's clock, avoiding bit errors, avoiding this pr problem. But in other schemes, when we have a long sequence of zeros or a long sequence of ones, the receiver can become out of sync in terms of the clock and as a result get bit errors. So that's the, an advantage in terms of some schemes provide inbuilt clocking or synchronization. In fact, our example was, was with bipolar AMI. And bipolar AMI has a problem if there's a long sequence of zeros in our data or, because it gets a zero line voltage for a long period of time. The last two schemes, they, they were shown on the previous slide, but they're called B8ZS and HDB3. These two described here are the same as bipolar AMI, but when there's a long sequence of zeros, like here, they replace that sequence with some other sequence, some non-zero sequence. So they try to avoid this problem so that we don't have bit errors due to missynchronization of clocks. So that's, they just do that in a different way. So there are a number of trade-offs. So there's no one best scheme. The remaining slides, this one's not so important. It's about the bit error rate in some schemes. This talks about uh, all right, bipolar AMI. And this describes this, these two other schemes, B8ZS and HDB3. We, don't, we will not go through that. It gives examples of these B8, bipolar AMI when there's a long sequence of zeros. What these two schemes do, when we have such a sequence, we replace it with some special sequence. See this special sequence here? Why is it special? With bipolar AMI, this is an error. We shouldn't have two levels, uh, two at the same positive level, one after another. So the receiver can detect that and know that, OK, this is a special sequence and convert it back to all zeros. Last thing, where are they used? 
non-return to zero are the simplest ones used, for example, in USB. Some serial devices, RS-232 serial devices, use them, and there is others. Manchester encoding is used in your wired Ethernet, so in your wired LAN connections, Manchester encoding and others. Some of the, those more complex ones we didn't go through, the HDB3 and so on, are used in long-distance WANs, wide area networks. There's some examples of where they're used. What you need to know for the exam definitely is NRZL, NRZI, how they work. And you need to know going back, given, for example, this, any of this information, you should be able to, given some data, draw a signal, or given a signal, decode and find the data. I would give information such as similar to this, but not for non-return to zero. You will remember them that easy. Okay? That's for the exam. And that finishes what we need to discuss for before the midterm. We will continue and go back at some of the things we skipped after the midterm for the other types of signals. Any questions on these before we say something about the exam? Sorry? Yes, you'll cover all this in the exam. When you look at past exams, you'll see most of the questions are given a signal, give me the data, or here's the data, draw the signal. Not too hard. 